Did everybody have a good lunch? Yeah. Oh, look at all this. I did. You got a lot more, Marty. did. I did. Uh, anyway. I'll have to read through these and then see where we're going from there. Yeah, that's a good one. We'll start here. Wasn't planning on it, but hey, they were here. Uh, can you touch more on, on sweating blood in the Garden of Gethsemane? Um, when Curry talked about it yesterday, I think he talked about the uh, total redemption for the total man. Part, I think it's section seven or something in this. Jesus paid for everything. Spirit, soul, and body, head to toe, uh, every bit of it. So he sweat drops of blood because he was in mental anguish. So really that stuff started happening there for your... M- Mental health, if we say. So mental health is a big thing these days, right? You hear that a lot with people with mental health issues and all that other kind of stuff. So Jesus paid the price even for that because he sweat drops of blood for your ang- for his anguish, but it was it's for you. Everything he did, he did for you, not for yourself, or not for himself. He did everything for us, everything. And Curry was going to be going over um, uh, Isaiah 53, and if he does that tonight, it'll, it'll kind of cover that off. Um, but... That's where it says he for our, he for our. He bore our, you know, our transgressions, our sorrows and our pains. And really when you track that down and, and study it out, when he, it says he bore our, our pains and sorrows and all that, it really means sicknesses and diseases. He bore that for us. But that's, you know, when we tell people to be whole, it's not just physical. It's everything. Because you can't be suffering through certain, certain things and be whole. So when we say be healed, be whole, we mean head to toe restoration. Because Jesus paid for it. Now, I think healing should be one of the easiest things that we can achieve for somebody because it's already been paid for. Right? So now when you're looking, it's it's not hard for me to say, okay, here's a receipt. I just bought you a I just bought you a fancy new TV down at the I don't know if you have a Best Buy here, but a Best Buy. Now all you have to do is go down and show that receipt and you're gonna pick up your fancy TV. Is that does that take much faith? The only faith you have to do, I'll take that back so I can answer that question. The, the only faith it takes is to whether I'm believing, when I'm, whether what I'm believing or telling you, you're believing that. Because you have to take that and you go down there. And once you get down there and you say, oh yeah, sure, Marty was just here, he paid for a TV, said you're going to come pick it up. It's done. There's, no, there's really no faith involved in that. When it comes to certain other things, you know, like prophecy or word of wisdom or any of that kind of stuff, that hasn't been done in the sense of past tense. But healing has been done. It's finished because he did it 2,000 years ago. So it's really not that hard to have something, faith for something that's already been done, if you think about it. You know, we're always trying to have, see, we're always trying to have faith. Now we're going to go on faith. We're trying, I'm trying. It, we're always trying to have faith for things. Faith for healing, faith for provision, faith for protection, faith, 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 faith. But God showed me a little while ago, we don't have golden corrals. In, in, in Canada. You, have, you all have golden crowds down here. So we used to go to them, but I'll, it, ain't, it ain't worth it. When, you, when you, you think it's okay, you're like, oh, we can eat this and that and the other thing. When you come out of there, you're like, Lord, have mercy, I need prayer. You know? <laughs> you, you come out of there and it's like, somebody's got to lay their hands on me. You know? And during the middle of the night, you wake up and you're, you could drink six gallons of water. And it's just, it's not worth it. We haven't been there in, in a long, long time. But he said, it's, God said, faith is like that. And I said, okay, well, what do you mean? So when you go into a place like the Golden Corral, you go in and it's ten ninety nine or fifteen. I don't know how much it costs nowadays, but we used to go; it was ten bucks. So you go in because we spend a lot of time in Spokane. That's why we'd go down there. But you go in there and you pay your ten dollars or whatever it is, and you have access to everything that's in in the restaurant. So when you go to the salad area, you don't have to pay one certain amount, and then you go over to the steak and lobster area. And you pay another certain amount. You pay one entry fee, and everything that's in there is available for you. God said it's the same thing with the kingdom of God. You pay an entry fee, if you will, getting saved, faith, believing, and everything within the kingdom is yours. And you can have as much as you want. Same thing with the Golden Corral. You go in there, you pay X amount of dollars, and you can eat until they carry you out of the place. Right? Is that not true? And you could only eat, if you want to, you can only eat the most expensive item they have there. Or you can choose to eat the less expensive item, but it doesn't cost you anymore. It's exactly the same thing with the kingdom of God. You go in and you have faith. Mark chapter 11 says, have faith in God. 
It doesn't say have faith in healing. It doesn't have to say have faith for you know, protection or provision or anything like that. It says have faith in God. And we can't um, take faith and put it in different compartments. You have faith in God. And so some people, they can have faith in one area for healing and live in divine health, but be broke all their lives because they don't have faith for provision. But it's because they're not having faith in God, they're having faith in certain things. And if you have faith in God, there's nothing you need to worry about. Like Curry was talking about yesterday when it comes to him not ever praying for his own needs because he doesn't need to pray for his own needs because God said, I will meet your needs. But it does say to pray for your desires. That is foreign to most people, you know, because you don't want to be selfish, you know. Well, if you're, if you're with God, then his desires are going to be your desires, and your desires are going to be his desires anyway. So why wouldn't he? If your desires line up with his desires, then he's truly giving you the desires of his own heart because your desires are going to line up. And God, God's not against us having stuff. He's against the stuff having you. He's not against, you know, a certain hobby or, you know, something of that nature. He's against the hobby having you. Because that hobby can become a God to you. And this is exactly why I had mentioned that I sold my race car. is because you literally spend a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort, bring a whole team with you and do that, as opposed to bringing a whole team with us and go around and preach the gospel. So I got, like I said, I don't want to rehash that, but I got over it and I got rid of it because I didn't want anything to even have a potential of slowing me down. You know, and it's, we have to, the truth, pretty much in everything, you get out of it what you put in it. I don't care what it is. If it's a hobby, if it's, if it's worldly stuff, or if it's spiritual stuff, you will get out of your spiritual life what you want to put it, into it and what you put out of it and what you try to do with it and all that stuff. The truth of the matter is you are exactly where you want to be in your life right now. That's true. And people can say, oh, that's not true. I don't want to be here. No, you desire to change, but you will to stay the same. Because you are where you will to be. So your desire is not the same as your will. You can desire something and then change to will, but ultimately you're going to do what your will wants you, what your will dictates you to do. Do you see what I mean by that? See, we desire to be different. We desire to have more of God flowing through us. But are you going to will to do the thing you desire? See, God will give you the desires of your heart, but it's not automatic. See, God doesn't just say, well, just sit there, tell me your desires, and poof, it's going to be there. That's not true. It takes effort because you get out of it. God says that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So your life all comes together the way you want it to, and you are exactly where you want to be at this time. You may not be happy. You may be completely miserable. You may hate where you are. But you are where you are because you made the decisions to put yourself there. So now you're going to make the decisions to get yourself out of there. And sometimes change can take a while because if it took you 50 years to dig a hole, if you're living in a hole, it might take you a little bit to you know, kind of build yourself back up and get you out of there. But God can absolutely reach down inside that hole and pull you out instantly. So a long time ago when I started learning this, I was on the phone with my cousin because, like I said, I phoned everybody. I think I, I, I know, I don't, I don't think this. I preach to my dog, you know, just to practice, you know. Be whole, be healed, you know. And we kept him alive for 15 and a half years. We did, you know. Tor towards the end of learning this message, one, one time we went on a, on a mission trip, the first mission trip we ever went on to Mexico. And uh, we woke up that morning to get on the plane and the dog couldn't move. It never happened to him before. And our dog was our dog, you know. We love our dog. And um, he couldn't move. He was paralyzed in this, in this one, one arm. I think it was his front shoulder. And mo a lot of people would have said, well, I guess we can't go. And I said, the devil's not going to stop me from going. So we loaded him up in the car. Our son drove us down to the airport, and we prayed for him all the way there. There was no change in him. We're going anyway. Let us know how he is. Jumped on the plane. By the time we flew to Mexico, got off the plane, the dog was perfectly fine. It was a distraction. Not going to let that happen, right? So all these distractions do come up. But... Um, we kept our dog alive through that, but I preached to everybody and everybody I possibly could who could hear this message because I was getting it in me and it was so getting in me, I had to get it out of me. And I was talking to my cousin and I said, one of the most freeing things for me was learning that I'm in charge of my spiritual growth. I said, 
I'm responsible for my growth or my lack of growth, not God. And he's like, why do you find that encouraging? Because I can stop blaming God. So I blamed him for everything. See, it's so easy to blame God for everything. Well, God, you hasn't, haven't released me. It's your fault, so therefore I'm not responsible. God's already released you. When you made him Lord, you're released. Here's the amazing thing. We, we always tell people, well, you come into church, and I mean, not this church. Again, when I say the church, I don't mean this church, okay? So um, when you, I don't want him to get mad at me. He doesn't get, he doesn't get mad at me. No, yeah, I'm trying. No. When, uh, when you come into church, you know, if you sit here for 10 years, then we'll make you an usher. Then, it, you know, but, but praying for people, oh, no, you can't do that. We've got to make sure God anoints you and God sets you apart and does all this kind of stuff. We'll put you through seminary school and then maybe, maybe you can receive the offering. And you have to work your way through it. Okay? And that's what happens, right? You're not... God's got to wait to release you. What about the guy I was talking about earlier this morning that had 2,000 demons or so? He came to Jesus. All that stuff happened. Jesus said, be free or whatever. Then they came back and they found him sitting there eating, clothed, and in his right mind. Is that what the Bible says? Yes. And then what, ha- what happened? Jesus was going to leave, and he said, I want to go with you. And Jesus said, no, no, no. Go, go back to your hometown. Tell of everything the goodness of God. Tell, tell him what God did for you. Instant ministry. Yes. 2,000 demons. <laughs> evangelist. <laughs> Where's the seminary? <laughs> Instant. Why? Because if you have a testimony, and every single one of us has a testimony, you have a ministry. Because it's all, if all you know how to say is, Jesus Christ set me free from whatever, you're free. And you have a testimony. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be an expert in the Bible. I'm not. I just know a couple of things really good, really well. But he went. Now, he went into this area... In, in, a, in a place called Decapolis. And that was a group of 10 cities. Okay, so we went there and telling what Jesus told him to tell. How good God was, how good, good things that God did for him, all that kind of stuff. Later on, about 45 years later or so, there was some persecution that came along the Christian church, all that kind of stuff, and they had to flee. Well, where do you think they fled to? Decapolis, where this man had been doing work. And everybody got in there and was safe. If that man hadn't gone back and did what he did, that probably wouldn't have happened. Because his testimony helped. And we overcome the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So if you have a testimony, you have a ministry. Now, you may not be called to full-time ministry in the sense of that's what you do all the time. You may not. We're all called to full-time ministry. But you may not be playing strange and automobiles and standing behind them, all that kind of stuff. But you have a ministry. And don't let anybody tell you that you don't have a ministry. You do have a ministry. You have the ministry, like Curry was saying yesterday, of reconciliation. To reconcile people to Jesus Christ. And you do not need a piece of paper. You do not need a degree. You do not need a special anointing. You do not need your pastor's permission. You do not need his blessing, his hands laid upon you. None of that stuff. What you need is the words of your mouth. And you have a ministry. Start there. Now, we have people that want to join JGLM, and they say, well, I don't know what to do. I'm the only one in my city or town or community or whatever that believes this. I'm all by myself. Good. Then God's got one. He changed the world with one, and his, man was Jesus, his name was Jesus Christ. Right? <coughs> well, I don't have a church that I can go to that, that believes this message. Good. Start one. It's, it's, it's initiative. You get out of it what you put into it. To take that, you know, the bull by the horns, as they say, to work that through. Now, I was really happy when I found out that God wasn't responsible for my spiritual growth. Will he help me? Of course he'll help me. Does he lead me and guide me in all truth? Absolutely. But if I do nothing, what's he going to lead me and guide me in? Nothing. He can't lead. The one thing he can't lead you in is all action. And that's what Christians are looking for, for the most part, to be led in all action. Well, I don't feel led. Like Curry was talking about yesterday. Well, I can't go pray for this person because I don't feel led. You have a leading. It's in a command. Like you were saying yesterday, I don't know if there's anybody in here in the military or has been in the military or anything, but 
if you if you have your commanding officer and he says, hey, go there and do this, and you're like, well, I just don't feel led. <laughs> so does anybody here have a job? Anybody? <laughs> like five people have jobs? <laughs> Man, y'all retired in this town? I'm going to move down here. It's all right. You have a job. Do you have a boss? Are you going to work tomorrow? Yeah. You're not work today. But for those who are going to work tomorrow and have a boss, does the boss tell you what to do? Mm-hmm. Okay. So tomorrow, when you go there and you get your assignment, he tells you what to do. Just say, I just don't feel led. <laughs> say that one too many times, you'd be let out the door. <laughs> and you might be holding a pink slip or whatever they give you here. Why does that work with, with Christ? And it doesn't work in, in your workplace. It doesn't work in anything else. Mommy, I'm hungry. Well, I just don't feel led to feed you. <laughs> it doesn't work. Right? Why does it, why does it seem to work with, with Jesus? You know, why do you... You know, like, like even Curry said yesterday, it was, it was brilliant. It's, I always say, every, every time the man opens his mouth, it's just... This is wisdom comes out, you know. Like it's got some sort of a wisdom bank in there. Just it all comes out. But you know, when it comes to the Word of God, we we when it comes to dealing with people, you want a contract. So some people at work they have a contract at work, right? So my we we sell homes and things back home. My son's doing. It. We don't do it anymore. But we have contracts on everything. We don't just take their word for it that they're going to buy a home. We have it on paper. Why? So we can trust them. But yet with God's word, we have it on paper. And like Curry said yesterday, but yet we want a word from God before we do anything. This is God's will, not, well, not this manual, but you know what I mean, the scriptures. This is God's will. So why on earth do we need for him to speak? He's already spoken, it's right here. But we want some whimsical thing, because usually because it's, you know, it makes, our, makes us sound more spiritual. Oh, God spoke to me. God speaks to you all the time. Do you recognize it? So a lot of people, most Christians say, well, God never speaks to me. No, you just don't listen. You know, it, you just don't, you haven't developed... The, that ability to discern your voice, the devil's voice, God's voice, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, all three of them can speak to you because they're all three are separate but one. So they can't all speak to you. And I found it joyful that I could stop blaming God for everything and look at myself and say, if I'm not growing, it's my fault, not anybody else's. And that took away another pity party. It's my responsibility to grow. Because God has given me, past tense, everything that pertains to life and godliness. But what am I doing with it? And there's no excuses. There really isn't. The truth of the word of God pulls out every excuse that you could ever build. If you, you, build in a, you, you have an excuse, God's got an answer. It's in the book. You know, and it's, it's amazing to me. So um, he found that weird. But I find it encouraging. Because I'm, I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight for, my, for everything that I have. Why not enjoy the inheritance? Because it's my inheritance. Why not live in divine health? Why not live in peace and joy and all these different things? Because it's mine. And if it's mine, it's my right to take it and to exercise it. So then you have these testimonies, these wonderful testimonies and things that are happening. It's amazing. That's because healing is our Right. It's not just something that God's decided to do if you're nice or not, like Curry's been teaching for the last couple of days, but it's, it's our right as a Christian. Because he, he paid... Do you realize the price? Most people don't understand this. Do you realize the price that Jesus paid on the whipping post? Have you ever studied that out? It's mind-blowing. I, get, you know, I do my best to talk about it, but I usually can't um, because I end up bawling my eyes out. Right? The Bible says Jesus wept. Jesus was the greatest man that ever lived, so if I cry, now I'm all good with it. Sometimes we go to a movie or something. Like, she's like, you crying? Nope. No, okay. <laughs> Got some hot sauce in my eye. Jesus wept. He was the greatest man who ever lived. On the whipping post. I'll just tell you. He went to the whipping post. They stripped him down. And they took, they took, we might even go to Mark chapter 5, but they took this whip that they had made. See, people think that Jesus was whipped 39 times. He was not whipped 39 times because he was whipped under Roman law, not Jewish law. Jewish law, they whipped you 40 minus 1. And do do you know why they did the 40 minus 1 thing? It's because they were only allowed to whip you 40 times. 
and if they miscounted, anything over 40, the person being whipped got to turn the tables. And the person doing the whipping didn't want to get a whipping back. So it was 40 less one. So 39 times. And people think this is how Jesus was whipped 39 times. No, he was not. He was, he was whipped almost beyond recognition. They almost, they almost killed him. Okay? They could actually kill you on the whipping post by Roman law. So they whipped him with the Roman flagellum. And it was like a cat of nine tail sort of thing. And it had bone and glass and all these different things in it with hooks and hooks in it. And it would, it would go in there and, and literally tear the flesh off his bones. He wasn't just whipped. He was mutilated head to toe. And the Bible actually... See? It's hard for me to talk about this. Because he did it for me. When they, when they did that to him... In the, in the Hebrew, the Bible actually says, by his stripe, you are healed. Not his stripes. It's not plural. The reason that is, is because in order to say stripes, singular, not stripes, plural, is because there couldn't be uh, about a thumb's width, an inch width, which width between the stripes. Otherwise, it would be stripes, not stripe. So pretty much everything on his body was no wider than this. Because they tore him to shreds. His face is like, I mean, you name it, they tore him to pieces for a very long time. And then he had to carry his cross up there. And then he went up there and he got up on Calvary and he did that and they dropped him into the hole and every, he, was, they would, he would be hunkered down. So every time he tried to speak, he would have to raise himself up to speak and then let, him, let himself go. That's what he did for you. And there's a lot more to it to study it out, to realize what he had done. But it's amazing just to learn to study that out and realize, oh, Jesus took some stripes from me and he was, he was on a, look at it. It'll change you. And what's amazing is, I think it's in Mark chapter five, when the woman uh, came to him and, and she, wanted to be, she needed to be healed. And Jesus said that I will, I will, maybe we'll look at it, but you know, he said, be free of that plague. He said it twice in there, of that plague. And we look at sickness and disease like a blessing, that God's trying to teach you something. That's funny because Jesus called it a plague. The word plague is the same word used for the Roman flagellum that Jesus was beaten with. So he actually said, woman, you are loosed from this plague. Which means what? I'm going to take the beating, the whipping that Satan has been putting on you, and I'm going to take that for you. It was a plague, a whipping, a beating for years that, he had been put, that Satan had put on her. And we say, God's trying to teach us a lesson through that sickness. How is that possible? I'm, then I'm done with God. Because at least, like, like I said on Sunday, in, in, in the world, I can fend for myself. If it's just me against the world, I'll take the word on, world on. But if it's, if it's me against God, I'm finished. Like There's no hope. If God ever wanted to wipe you out, he's not going to just take the transmission out of your truck. Right? If God wants to wipe you out, he's, just, he's not going to give you a headache. If God wanted to wipe you out, God, at times disintegrated cities. So much of that was through sowing and reaping, by the way. Okay? God doesn't do that. There's some things in the Old Testament that God had to do because he was a just God. He couldn't deal with man the way he wanted to because there was a separation. But through Jesus Christ, everything has been changed. The veil has been removed. Now God looks at us like, like he looks at his own son because we're in him. And technically, we're in covenant with Jesus, and Jesus is in covenant with God. It's amazing. So everything we do, we do in him. So he sees us as he sees his own son. And what did he call him? Perfect lamb, spotless, without sin. And that's how he sees us. But we don't see ourselves that way. We see ourselves as spotted and broken and all that other kind of stuff. The Bible says to not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Pretty hard to think of yourself more, like, more high, or higher than what Jesus thinks of you, what the Bible says about you. When it talks about that, it's talking about don't put yourself in front of another person or above another person. Don't think of yourself better than anybody else. That includes you who may be up here and say somebody in society that's way down here. Because God's not a respecter of persons. And this is why, we'll try to get to the anointing thing here, but God... Is, the Bible says he's not a respecter of persons. So he cannot anoint Pastor Barrett and not anoint me. 
because then he would be a respecter of persons. He can't give him a gift of healing and not me because then he just became a respecter of Barrett. He gave everything to everybody. It's just sometimes people develop a stronger faith in that. Usually something that you have suffered, you become a little bit more prolific in. You know, because you, you have a desire for that thing, to help people, to set people free in that area because you suffered from that. But maybe we'll have the next session, maybe we'll talk about the gifts of the Spirit because that's one thing I didn't really understand is spiritual gifts. Because I thought that we all got doled out a, a spiritual gift. That is not true. Every single Christian gets every one of the spiritual gifts. Okay? Now, it's not a gift to you, it's a gift through you. It's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. So you're, we used to, when we first got saved, we went to a church and they had a, um, like a questionnaire type of thing and it says, determine your spiritual gift. And I'm like, yes, I'm going to find out what my spiritual gift is. Yay, you know. It's like waiting for Christmas or something. So we go through this and it's a little, all these questions, yes, no. And I think it was actually a score thing, like one to 10, do you like to talk to people? Okay, well, that's a 10. And do you like to do this? No, that's a one. And you go through this and at the end of it, you add up your score and then there's a scale and it tells you what your spiritual gift is. What a load of hogwash. <laughs> but that's how, we, that's how we operated. And I never knew what my spiritual gift is because you have all these people going around teaching that you get one spiritual gift. You don't even get a spiritual gift. You get the gift that Curry was talking about yesterday, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And all the spiritual gifts are just manifestations of him through you. That's it. And Paul said, be all things to all men. So you can't need a gift of healing or to operate in healing and then say, just a second, then go get my pastor. He's going to come and help me. Wait right here. I'm going to get him on the phone. In 30 minutes, he should be able to be here. He's pretty quick. How can you help people like that? You know, some people don't need healing. Some people need a word of wisdom. Some people need a word of knowledge. You know? Yeah. Well, we might as well continue for this. We'll just slap that aside. Okay. So a word of wisdom has nothing to do with how intelligent you are. A word of wisdom has nothing to do, and some of these some people know this now. There's been some other teachings about it and things like that. But a word of wisdom, you know, it used to be taught that how smart you were, or how you know a man's wisdom or something. It has nothing to do with man's wisdom. A word of wisdom has to do with knowledge that can only come from God about the future. A word of wisdom has nothing to do with the past. It has nothing to do with the present. It always has to do with the future. Now, a word of knowledge has to do with the f now or the past. So you can have a word of knowledge for somebody saying, hey, listen, do you have a, you know, um, you get headaches or whatever the case may be, whatever God decides to use you in. Or you can say, hey, listen, I think, you know, there's something here that's, that's holding you up and you can, do, you can deal with that. But it, it has nothing to do with the word of wisdom in the sense or knowledge in how intelligent you are. And that's what, that's what was taught a while back is, you know, how smart you are. And that's simply not true. And then you can get into the gifts of healings, and Curry kind of touched on this. It's the only plural gift. It's gifts of healings, if you look at it in the Greek. And that's because Dr. Summerall used to teach for every sickness, there's a gift of healing for it. So the gift, the, the best way I can liken it is, if you're at home and you're on Amazon, let's say, and you got your computer out and you go through and you see what you need and you press the buy button, right away the people at Amazon get the package ready and they usually put it in a UPS or FedEx or Pure Later or whatever you guys have and they ship it. Now, that thing was never meant for the delivery driver. It came from the source and it's going to the one who needs it. The delivery driver was just the go-between. He takes the package, he goes to the person and he gives the package. His job is done. It's exactly the same thing. God gives you a word of wisdom, a... a word of knowledge, uh, gift of healing, whatever it is, he gives that through you to that person. That's all it is. So when it's that simple, we can't get hung up on, <laughs> I'm gifted. But we do. And we look at people and then we, we say they're anointed. And then we exalt them. Well, that's their gift, not my gift. You know, there's, recently there was a man, um, really, really well-known whatever you want to call him, evangelist, speaker, whatever you, whatever you want. In some hot water. Done some pretty bad stuff. Done some really bad stuff in the past. Got through it. Done some really bad stuff now. There were some people trying to speak into his life. 
And he literally told them, you can't speak into my life because I operate at a higher anointing than you do. Where's the humility in that? That is not true. You don't find that in the Bible. If so, Jesus couldn't have talked to anybody because he operated at a higher level of anointing, if you will, than anybody. But what that does is it separates you from the rest of the, the people. And then it puts you up here and, and you're exalted by man. And that's exactly what's happening in the church so many places is that people are, are getting exalted. So you have prophets and apostles and all these things that are rising up inside the church because they're, going, they're getting there not because God ordained them to be there but because man has risen them to be there. Usually it's because they tithe the most. And then they, they get exalted. See, everything's about money. So there's, there's a misteaching in the church about, about spiritual gifts. And what there's... You're not even... Okay. I think Curry kind of touched on this in 1 Corinthians 5, uh, where it talked about there was sin in the church and all that kind of stuff that wasn't even in the world. Okay? Then you get into 1 Corinthians 12, where it, it describes the spiritual gifts. They, he described those to the carnal church. And we think operating in a spiritual gift is the pinnacle of our Christian maturity. But yet he described it to an immature church. Jesus never operated by a spiritual gift. He operated by the fullness of the Spirit. So we're always looking for spiritual gifts. So it's almost like we're trying to stay immature. You know, and we're going to get into Ephesians chapter 4, um, where it talks about you know, getting tossed wind, uh, around with every wind of doctrine. You know, when it says to be no more as children, the word children means immature Christian. We have so much immaturity in the body of Christ. And that's not because God's not trying to get it out. That's because people aren't willing to pick it up. And God is just looking for faithful people, men and women, that are going to stand up and fight the good fight of faith. You know, um, he's just looking for faithful men. Was that movie years ago with Tom Cruise or A Few Good Men? You know, he's, he's just looking. And, and, in the, remember in that movie, you want the truth, you can't handle the truth, and whatever his name was. And, and that's true for the church today. You, you give them the truth, and most of the church can't handle the truth today. The truth is, you see, where, where was the lady that had the, the swords on, on the sword? Was it you that had the, on the back? Okay. I wasn't quite, I was back there in the dark, so. Or whatever it was. The, the, the masses. The masses, that's what it was. Amazing. And, and Curry was just here. That's the goodness of God. That's the goodness of God that did that. That's the the price that Jesus paid 2,000 years ago on that whipping post. See, people talk about, you know, healing angels and and sending down healing angels and all this kind of stuff. You are healed one way. That is by the stripes of Jesus Christ. There's nothing in there about healing angels. There's nothing in there about any of that kind of stuff. You are healed by the stripes of Jesus, period. Not by anything else. You cannot be... The problem is we have people that are, like we were talking about earlier, dealing in psychology, trying to solve a spiritual problem. Often we're dealing with that situation right now. The doctors cannot find anything wrong with this particular person. So they've said nothing. Every doctor, every, everything that, that he's ever been to, they cannot find a problem. But he has a problem. It's spiritual. And the doctors, psychologists, things like that, cannot solve that. So you end up going to them for years and, and just getting messed around and wasting a bunch of money because it's something that the Spirit of God could have taken care of in five seconds. Yes. But we want to go there and, and try to get ourselves fixed through natural means. Like Curry said yesterday, sometimes doctors are, are closer to the heart of God than most Christians are because at least they're trying to help people. Mm-hmm. Right? But there is one that can help you continually, and his name is God. See, here's the thing. I asked this at our life team a little while ago. Do you see God as God, or do you see God as Father? It's a, it's a, it's a deep question. Because he's both God. He's all God. And he's also all Father. The problem is religion sees him mostly as God. Because God is, is you know, sovereign and, and in control and this taskmaster and, I mean, all that, this God. Most people can't see him as Father. He is all God. He is all just. He is all powerful. He's omnipresent, omnipotent. I mean, he is omni everything. But he's my Father. And this is where the relationship comes in. It's harder to have a relationship this way when you see him as God, especially the God of the Old Testament. 
God never changed his mind. He didn't wake up one day and say, wow, I was mean to those guys. I better change. He's God. He changes not. Jesus Christ became that perfect lamb for us, so the division was gone. The separation with God was gone, and now God could finally deal with people the way he wanted to deal with people. And this is the way he wants to deal with people. Be whole, be healed, be set free, be delivered, no fear, no guilt, no shame, total freedom. That's an amazing place to live. But most people don't understand that. And it's, it's a travesty because every time we claim to be free and we're not, we're doing it an injustice to what Jesus did for us. And that's really... I, I can't even say that we do this for me personally because everybody we meet deserves it. Most of us don't deserve God's help. I'd say pretty much all of us don't deserve it. I mean, if you look back to who we were and what we've done, really, if you think about it, but he deserves it. He deserves everything that he paid for. And I'm, I'm doing my best to, to get that out, to, to, to bring that out and to get people whole and healed and set free so they can do the exact same thing. See, it would be easy to come in here and just have a healing service, lay hands on you guys and say, oh, good, go home. But it doesn't do any good to get you, to keep you free. Now, if we can come in here and train 100 people, cool. But if each one of you can go out and train 100 people, you know, then we got thousands. That's what we need to do. You know, we need to, we need to, to rise up and to train people properly. And this, this is exactly what we're trying to do. So we're trying to get to Section 15, but I think we have to take a break right now. Is that right? Because we started at 2, right? We're going to keep on schedule. So I promise when we come back, I'm going to go through these questions, but we'll come back in a few minutes and we'll start on section 15, page 31, or 131. It goes fast.